everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for today's session. Today, we're going to be looking at co-ownership issues in residential conveyancing and looking at some of the best practices and lessons from recent case law as well. My name is Stephen Smith, and I'm delighted to be joined, as always, by Ian Quayle and my colleague, Robert Kelly. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so many of you are regulars to these webinars um, and don't enjoy the bit I do at the start, but uh, there are some people that have signed up for the first time. So before I hand over to Ian, just want to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Everyone should be able to see a control panel on their screen, so I just want to take you through that quickly. You'll be listening through your computer speaker system by default. If you'd prefer to join over the telephone, you can just select the telephone option in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Uh, it is toll-free, there's no extra cost of using that feature. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to Ian and by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel, you can send questions at any time during the presentation and we will collect these at the end and address them in a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. You can also raise your hand during the presentation if you're having any difficulties with the sound or any other technical issues. We will be able to chat to you over the chat box feature and you can also um, reach me directly if you respond to the the go-to webinar emails you've been receiving. So if you have any technical issues, please do get in touch. As normal, we've included the notes for today's session in the handout section of your control panel. Again, if you're having issues accessing these, then please do get in touch. Um, you can either talk to me through the chat function or via email through GoToWebinar. Just on that, we have a, a library of webinars which we've <laughs> held previously with Ian uh, on our YouTube channel. The link to the channel is in the chat section of the control panel. Um, there's roughly 80 courses on the website now covering all aspects of residential and commercial conveyancing. We've also included a link to our LinkedIn page, which details all of the up and coming webinars and news of new products and services that we're offering. Anyway, without further ado, I'll pass you on to Ian for the main part of today's presentation. Thanks, Ian. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. And again, a massive thank you, as always, to my friends at uh, Stuart Title for inviting me along. Do have a look at Stuart Title's website and LinkedIn page, etc., to have a look at what they're about and what they're doing. And of course, do remember that if you've got a title indemnity issue, even if it's not one of the sort of on a standard type of policy, then Stuart uh, Title with Stephen Robert and their colleagues are more than happy to have a look at sort of standalone policies, unique policies, etc., and to help. So uh, a massive thank you to everyone uh, at Stuart Title for inviting me along and a massive thank you for you coming along today. I hope you're managing to stay warm and to uh, avoid the snow, etc. It's grim up north, but then it normally is, isn't it? But uh, we'll survive, I'm sure. Yeah, co-ownership. Happy, happy topic to talk about, a happy hunting ground for professional negligence claims and to an extent also an area for client dissatisfaction. So what I want to do today is to drill down and have a look at what can go wrong and why and have a look at what we can do in order to protect ourselves and our firms and of course to do the best by our clients. I always show this slide, don't I, in connection with websites? Yes, I know. But again, it's useful just to be aware that the Property Litigation Association website will highlight cases from time to time that are significant for residential conveyances. Their website's just been revamped, to be honest with you, but you can still find a case law update section that's really useful. Um, and it's well worth a look at if you're dealing with co-ownership problems or issues in connection with beneficial interests or trusts relating to conveyancing transactions. Why is co-ownership problematical? The first thing we're going to have a look at. Well, why? I think firstly, because we can't charge for co-ownership issues as an additional feature of the conveyancing service that we provide. It's expected that where we're acting for two or more buyers of a property or two or more sellers of a property, that the co-ownership conundrums and issues that we have to deal with and fence with are part and parcel of the service. We can charge where we're creating a deed of trust, more likely our private client department will charge in connection with a deed of trust, but for the sort of rank and file advice and uh, explanation that we're providing relating to co-ownership, it's inbuilt with the price. That's the first problem. So to do the job properly, we've got to extract a lot of information from clients 
we've then got to explain to clients choices that are available to them then we've got to wait for clients to feed back to us what they want to do with regard to choice and then we've got to say to the clients well yeah what you're proposing appears to be fair and reasonable because or on the other hand what you're proposing is not fair and reasonable because what you're asking us to do bears no relation to what your actual contributions are or what your intentions are or what your circumstances would justify and then what, what we've got to do is we've got to follow up and make sure the client understands the consequences of what they've asked us to do. Generally speaking, where what they're wanting us to do and what we're advising are consistent with one another, life is moderately easy, life becomes quite difficult where the clients are wanting us to press on, uh, notwithstanding the fact that what they want is contrary to what we've advised and what would be reasonable. So I think insufficient time and insufficient fees are a, post, a, a problem. Uh, assumptions, making assumptions is the, probably the biggest issue. And when I talk about making assumptions, there are two things. Firstly, number one, if we look at the current form of co-ownership in connection with a sale and simply think that all we're going to do is mirror that in connection with our purchase, that's dangerous. It might in most circumstances be the obvious thing to do it might be the perfectly acceptable thing to do but i don't think we can assume because mr and mrs jones who we act for in connection with the sale of 12 arcacia gardens owners joint tenants in law and in equity that enables us to automatically say in connection with their purchase of 49 the grove the same form of co-ownership should apply circumstances may change circumstances may have changed and therefore it's important that we undertake the same sort of exercise as we would when mr and mrs jones are first buying a property together i think the other thing with regard to uh, assumptions is that mr and mrs jones may not be aware or may not remember what was told to them first time around and therefore we've got to be careful I think the next thing with regard to an assumption is that where we have unequal contributions, where we have commercial relationships, et cetera, we automatically think that this is a tenancy in common in equity. Well, again, I think that's dangerous. It might in most cases be entirely appropriate, but there could be from time to time a situation where it makes sense for commercial owners making unequal contributions to owners joint tenants in law and in equity. I mentioned in the third bullet point here, this issue about gathering information and assimilating information from clients. I hope now that most firms use co-ownership questionnaires. And I hope those co-ownership questionnaires do three things. One, they extract what the client would like to do from the client. Two, they get background as to the client's circumstances. Have they been married before? How are they amassing the funds to facilitate the purchase? Going forward, who's going to be paying mortgage under their outgoings? Going forward, is there a likelihood of money coming in, pension lump sums, inheritances, bonuses, etc., and that money being ploughed into the property? Um, what about a situation where the client is buying a house at £500,000 and uh, the house is a doer-upper? I hate that term, but there you go. Too much watching to... Uh, homes under the hammer but in those circumstances five hundred thousand pound purchase one million spent on doing the property up well who's funding that million pounds in connection with construction work the next thing is inadequate recording and this again is a sort of common problem in connection with conveyancing i was doing some face-to-face -face training on tuesday and i thought at one stage i was going to get lynched because i was saying look you know there are times when it's essential that you make a full and detailed record of what your client has said or what you've said and what the sort of conclusion of a meeting has been be it a virtual meeting a face-to-face -face meeting or a telephone call and you know everyone was saying Ian, we don't have time to do that you know we can't make a verbatim note of a conversation and i get that and what i say to practitioners is this certainly where a client is asking you to do something that's contrary to logic and contrary to your advice, that would be a situation where I would make a detailed note as to the meeting. And I would probably send the client 
a record of the meeting, ask them to confirm it's true. And I would certainly email the client to confirm what was said and what was concluded. And where what the client is proposing is contrary to my advice, I would protect myself and my firm by asking the client to acknowledge receipt of the note or the evidence that I'm producing uh, in support of what was said and ask them to confirm it's a fair and true record of what was said. Because if something goes wrong, when something goes wrong in that relationship and buyer number one realises that they're receiving 10% of the proceeds of sale, having contributed half in connection with the purchase price, meaning that they're not going to be able to afford to rehouse themselves and their partner that's disappeared with someone in uh, from work to start a new relationship is now skipping off into the sunset with 90% of the proceeds of sale and is buying a brand new luxury apartment on the outskirts of London somewhere on the Thames, you can see how that grief as it were, private grief as between the individuals could manifest itself in the dissatisfied client having a look to determine who it's possible to uh, transmit their grief onto. And unfortunately for you and I, that's going to be you and I and our lovely professional indemnity policies. So do be careful about recording intention, about recording explanation and about recording advice. Be careful about relying on standard emails or hard copy letters or the report on title to protect yourself. I think it's imperative that we explain choice, but that at the end of the day, we give our client freedom to choose. When they have selected their choice, we then provide explanation. Yes, what you're doing seems eminently sensible. And yes, that's what we would advise, given what we know and given your circumstances. Or alternatively, we challenge the client and say, well, no, you shouldn't be doing that. So a failure to record advice given, failure to record circumstances in which explanation and advice is given, failing to ascertain why clients have chosen a particular route, I think can all lead to fatality with regard to a claim or a client complaint. I think there are three really good habits to have with regard to onboarding co-owners and scoping the retainer with regard to co-owners and managing the relationship with co-owners. One, there isn't such a thing as a collective client. Mr. and Mrs. Jones are not joined at the hip and therefore you cannot give Mr. and Mrs. Jones collectively um, advice. They are individuals that have, may have individual levels of knowledge of the conveyancing process, different attitudes to risk. There may be one dominant partner in the relationship that is sort of holding sway with, with regard to what's being proposed or what's to be done. Now, on the issue of no such thing as a collective client, we've always got to bear in mind that we're dealing with individuals. But in order to act in connection with co-ownership, our friends, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, must be singing from the same hymn sheet. They must be giving instructions to us that are the same. But we've got to be aware of risk of undue influence, risk of one party not having the sufficient capacity or levels of understanding to make reasonable reasonable decisions etc and again on that point i'm sort of uh, at the moment spending a lot of time looking at decisions of the solicitor's disciplinary tribunal and there are lots of decisions over the last few months where lawyers solicitors are getting hammered on the basis that they didn't know who their client was or they didn't know the client well enough to know that there was a capacity problem or a client that was being pressurized by members of the family. And I think the reason for this hammering is because during lockdown and thereafter, we're dealing with clients far more at sort of um, arm's length via virtual communication or via email. And we're not seeing clients the way we used to. And we couldn't therefore anal analyze the relationship and say, well, yeah, perhaps there's a, an issue here with regard to undue influence, or perhaps the fictitious Mrs. Jones um, is elderly and appears not to understand what's going on, etc. So I think we've got to get to know and we've got to risk assess each client. And then what we've got to be happy that what we are being asked to do is consistent with client instruction and that we're happy to act for both. I think it's important that we identify financial contributions in connection with acquisition. 
and also in connection with long-term management of the property. And it's important that we identify client intentions, medium to long-term, particularly important where there's plans to develop or spend money in connection with construction or renovation. And also, I think it's important to where we're looking at a deed of trust in connection with a tenancy in common, to also think, is the deed that we're creating also going to manage that relationship and provide the clients with the appropriate exit strategies in circumstances where the relationship comes to an end or where the commercial arrangement uh, no longer applies or the objective in connection with the acquisition is now at an end. So we need to be careful with that. Often with the deed of trust, what practitioners are thinking about, uh, particularly where they're dealing with it rather than private client, is that the deed of trust is critical to identify contribution. But remember, it does more than that, doesn't it? It manages the relationship, it manages the trust, and potentially also deals with what happens where there's a breakdown relating to that trust or a termination of the trust too. Turner against Bromwich Jackson is a great case, a 2016 decision in the High Court where a firm of lawyers well and truly stuffed the client in a negligence claim. Happy, happy days. Why did they do it? Well, she says, number one, you didn't explain the duties and obligations that arose courtesy of owning a property, the equitable interest in the property, as a tenant in common. Two, she said, you were in a position where acting for me and my former partner led to a risk of a conflict of interest. We were making unequal contributions, and as a consequence of that, you can't act for us. Nonsense, to be honest with you. The claim failed because the lawyers involved had done their job properly. One, they had explained choice. Two, it, they were led by the client with regard to that choice. Three, they'd investigated and determined that in all the circumstances, what the clients were proposing was fair and reasonable. They had been meticulous in providing a full explanation of what the declaration of trust did, and they also had evidence that the client was fully aware of her position. So you know I bleat on, don't I, about informed consent. I think Stephen once said I drone on, but we'll, we'll, we'll forgive him for that. But the important point is that uh, what happened in this case is the firm protected themselves. And interestingly, when you look at the case, there were more than one fear in there involved, and every one of them adopted the same uh, procedure, which tells me two things. One, the firm was switched on, and two, they had a policy as to how to deal with co-ownership that everyone knew and everyone followed. Great case to highlight the good habit that I mentioned earlier, keeping records of advice and conversations, particularly the tricky ones, particularly where you've got a difficult client. In this particular case, poor Miss Turner uh, lost. And uh, as I say, the lawyers went skipping off into the sunset. Oxley and Hiscock is a sort of family case, really, is, and it's a case that people will encounter when we start talking about orders for sales and talata, et cetera. But I have extracted this case and just want to highlight what the court said about the need for a conveyancer to acquire about sources of funds and also inquire about how mortgage and other outgoings was to be paid, making sure that sufficient information was extracted from clients to ensure proper advice could be given. So when you're onboarding co-owners or potential co-owners, two things. One, I think it's useful to, from the outset, when you're onboarding the client, to explain the choices that are available and to hit the client, as it were, um, figuratively, with the information that should enable them to start thinking about choice. And I think the other thing that you do is you ping across to them a um, co-ownership questionnaire for the clients to complete. Some firms ask each individual client to complete the questionnaire separately. I can understand why you do that on the basis that, well, if I do that, there's less risk of undue influence. But I think in practice, if you do that, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Jones are going to sit together and fill the form in together anyway. So if we're trying to preclude or prevent undue influence, I think we're going to fail. I think it is, it is important that both sign the document and that the document is dated. And I also think that when you're looking at your co-ownership questionnaire, you do assess it and say, am I asking all the right questions? So I'm not just interested in what are your 
in uh, financial contributions in connection with acquisition and going forward, I want to drill down and find out about Mr. and Mrs. Jones' history. So, for example, have they been married before? Have they got children from previous relationships? If they're contributing £100,000 one party, £50,000 the other, where's that coming from? And uh, are they uh, likely to be spending more money on the property going forward? It's this sort of thing that the questionnaire extracts. We've then got it on our file and we've then got evidence to support or back up the explanation and advice that we're going to be providing to the client. I would avoid where we've got the co-ownership questionnaire coming in, making a recommendation as to what's best. I would invite the clients to suggest what they want. Where clients basically say, I don't know, then I think we are in a difficult position. But my view is we say to them, well, on the facts, it would seem that this would be the sensible or logical thing to do. So no children from previous relationships, married couple, stable relationship, equal contributions. Clients say, we don't know. Clients are first time buyers. Well, perhaps a joint tenancy is appropriate and then explain why. In connection with the giving of advice, and I think this is one of the most important things to tell you today, it's absolutely essential that we don't just give clients a superficial explanation of what a joint tenancy or a tenancy in common is. I don't think it's necessary to explain to the lay client that the legal and equitable interests are divided, and that the legal interest must always be held as joint tenants. I don't think it's necessary. I think what we've got to do is be more practical than that and explain to clients that where they are joint tenants, they own half of everything, not half of the property, as it were. In, in other words, bedroom one's mine and bedroom two's yours. I think it's important that we explain what survivorship is. And a lot of firms, I don't think, drill down and tell clients about what happens in the event of common accident. I think that clients do not understand that severance can be a unilateral act and therefore relationship breakdown, change in circumstances. Mr. Jones can serve notice of severance on Mrs. Jones and there's nothing she can do about it. So I think that's important. With tenancies in common, I think it's important that we explain what happens on death with regard to the beneficial interest. And of course, that we advise Mr. and Mrs. Jones to have wills and significantly, we advise them to keep the deed of trust that our, we or our private client team are going to prepare under review. Where we are subdividing a beneficial interest where there are unequal contributions, it is important that the deed of trust or land registry form JO or the, um, the um, for a moment let's just get it right the transfer document sorry about that the transfer document in box 10 mirror what the client's actual contributions are i think there's a danger that if they don't then if there is a dispute or an argument one of the parties may argue that the, the party that's suffering detriment may argue that um, um that the documentation did not accord with actual contributions there are exceptional circumstances thus inviting the court to sort of uh, overlook the deeds and documents that have been prepared and give effect to contribution i think a good habit again bottom of slide here don't assume anything explain choices where clients have suggested what they like where clients don't know or don't understand or ask your opinion, then what you're doing is looking at the data and information that's being produced to you and checking what you think would be sensible or appropriate in the circumstances. Practical problems then. Do we explain in layman's terms the implications of a joint tenancy? Do we explain that we're creating a trust? Do we explain to clients that we're that trust comes to an end either party can apply for an order for sale and in most circumstances the court will order a sale do the clients understand that the proceeds of sale will be split on a 50 50 basis do clients understand what survivorship actually means and do the clients understand what can happen in the event of death of both again it might well be worth create uh, advising clients of the need for a will 
to prevent the common the uh, common accident principle that I mentioned biting. I think a lot of firms, when giving advice with regard to co-ownership, ignore or um, um, gloss over the position what happens if a party wants to sell so i think that's something that we can have a look at certainly this idea that the act of severance can be a unilateral act that brings the joint tenancy to an end and automatically creates a tenancy in common is something that is frequently overlooked where we're dealing with tenancies in common we've got to explain again in layman's terms what a tenancy in common is and explain to the client what happens on the death of a tenant in common. Uh, and again, what happens if a tenant in common wants to sell? Well, same principle really applies as with a joint tenancy. Two points to make. One, I think we deal with this when we're onboarding a client, when we're first um, taking instructions. I don't think we deal with this in the report on title. We mention what's being chosen in the report on title and the significance and consequence of choice. But I think we provide and arm our clients with information at the start. We get the questionnaire back from the clients. We then have either a meeting or a discussion or an exchange of emails relating to that choice. And then we go from there. I don't think that we simply um, suggest to clients what they want unless we first of all explain to the clients the consequence of what they want. It's, it's this issue of informed consent that I always go on about, remember? The idea that a client can't say a joint tenancy is appropriate, they don't know what a joint tenancy is. So we tell them what a joint tenancy is, we get the co-ownership questionnaire in, we then say what they would like, and then we go from there. I think when we're dealing with clients, we have to explain to clients that there is choice we have to crystal ball gaze and be a bearer of bad news with regard to circumstances where relationship comes to an end, there is a falling out, and then what is to happen where a property is sold with regard to proceeds of sale. So in those circumstances, I think the key issue is that clients understand and appreciate the consequence of the decision that's taken. The fact that someone who's paying for 80% of the property but happy that the partner receives a joint tenancy is in essence giving away 30% of the beneficial interest. And that may be perfectly acceptable at the moment when the relationship in, is in its sort of first blush and is in a situation where everyone is happy, but where third world war is declared three years down the line, that generosity will come back and bite our um generous co-owner and at that point their generosity might be regarded as foolishness by everyone and as i say and i mentioned in my introduction that's where finger pointing begins it is important that clients understand that as part of the conveyancing process you're going to provide explanation and information but i also think it's important that clients have drilled into them the fact that it may be necessary where there's relationship breakdown, where there's changes in circumstance, where the need arises, that they seek assistance from either you or your private client department. That becomes even more important as a consequence of what I'm going to show you in a minute or two. I think this good habit that I mentioned at the bottom of the slide is, is important. In connection with co-ownership, we should think about the present situation and make sure what we're doing uh, ensures that what we do, we've done is consistent with present circumstances, but also think about future. Future with regard to the property, future with regard to spend or commitment to the property, and future with regard to the relationship. So how could this manifest itself? I'm interested, how many firms have a sort of standard co-ownership email or a co-ownership information sheet? My guess is most will do that. But I think just check that over and just have a look at it and just ask yourself, well, all right, am I dealing with the here and now? But am I also forewarning and forearming the client about the need perhaps for advice and assistance in connection with the future? 
I now want to focus in for a moment or two about severing the joint tenancy. And again, it's important, I think, that clients appreciate the mechanics of severance. I'm a bit concerned about the firm saying a joint tenancy can be severed. If you want to know how to do it and its consequences, contact us or contact our family or private client team. Because what happens as far as the conveyancing client is concerned, once you've closed your file? Is the client uh, going to be comfortable or willing to instruct someone else in your firm for assistance or guidance? Therefore, I think it's important that we do tell clients the mechanics of severance. So severance can be the giving of notice. Theoretically, it can be a unilateral act that can constitute severance. So the client needs to understand that. The client needs to understand that it's possible to lodge a forms SEV at the land registry and to lodge an RX1. Also important that the client appreciates that the client may not be able to do that themselves and that it might be necessary for legal advice and assistance to be provided. The land registry do require supporting documentation to be lodged where a joint tenancy is severed. Uh, there is the appropriate practice guide to look at in that connection. I think clients should have explained to them severance. Every firm does that I've ever seen. I don't think claim, uh, firms explain how to sever. And I don't think firms explain the significance and consequences of severance. And the thing that really concerns me is that I don't think firms are telling clients about the fact that a joint tenancies can be severed unilaterally by one client. So, you know, we could be best of friends. Um, we could be, um, as I say, the start of a relationship. It could quickly sour and either party can immediately bring the joint tenancy to an end on giving notice to the other. I think clients need to understand that. There's quite a bit of case law on severance, but I've drawn to your attention two cases. The first case is Singler against Brown and Molden Brown, which is quite an old case now, 2007. But what happened in this case is that notice of severance was served by one party on the other to bring the joint tenancy to an end. But in this case, the notice of severance was quite unusual because it, what it said was, I'm severing the joint tenancy and from now on, the beneficial interest will be held. And I think from memory, it was 80% in my favor and 20% in yours. Now you'd imagine in that situation, the court would turn around and say, well, that's of no consequence. You sever a joint tenancy, you automatically create a tenancy in common on the basis of a 50-50 split, which would be the norm. But what the court said in this case was that is not right. The person serving the notice said this is how the beneficial interest is now going to be held, 80% in my favour. That was reasonable given that that party had indeed contributed 80% towards purchase price on the evidence. And significantly, the recipient of the notice acknowledged receipt and didn't challenge what was said with regard to the beneficial interest. Now, a little bit of a health warning with regard to this case. This was a case involving an insolvency, and therefore there might have been a bit of sympathy in connection with the party serving notice, and there might have been a little bit of sympathy in connection with the recipient on the basis that if the court permitted the beneficial interest to be 80-20 in favor of the party serving the notice, the other party's trustee in bankruptcy was entitled to a 20% share of the property, not a 50% share. So there's a bit of a health warning with the case. It is unusual in its own facts. It does, however, suggest that where you are serving a notice of severance and you are uh, provided with evidence that your client has uh, purchased or made contributions that mean their beneficial interest exceed 50%, I don't think there's any harm in saying from now on, this is how the beneficial interest is to be held. Boycott against Williams is a high court decision in which the claimant brought a claim against solicitors alleging negligence with regard to co-ownership. The claim failed due to limitation. But the interesting thing about this case is that Mr. Boycott, who was the claimant, contended that his lawyers had not explained to him in words that he could understand that um, Miss Williams would be uh, sorry that uh, his partner, not Miss Williams, the partner, his partner, could sever the joint tenancy at any time without him being able to intervene and prevent it. 
And what he said was, as a consequence, if I'd been aware of what my partner could do, I wouldn't have gone into a joint tenancy with her. Uh, Mr. Boycott's contention was that he was contributing significantly more to the purchase price of the property than she was. In essence, the creation of a joint tenancy generated significant benefit for her and that he had intended that the joint tenancy would exist, that in, on her death, he would have got his half share back and he was sort of relying on that. His argument was, had I known that uh, my partner could scupper my plans and intent, I wouldn't have done what I wanted to do. So that case is the case that I hang my hat on when I start talking about making sure that your client understands that where there is a joint tenancy, unilateral severance is possible. So that's the good habit that I mentioned on the bottom of the slide there. With regard to tenancies in common, of course, you've got to explain to clients that survivorship doesn't apply. We've got to explain to clients that it's important to have evidence of contributions and evidence of intention in the future with regard to works that may alter the beneficial interest. The situation is that what we want is our documentation, be it a deed of trust, be it land registry form JO, be it the transfer, all to sing from the same hymn sheet and all to have um, consistency with regard to contributions equaling share of beneficial interest. I make the point and I repeat it, that where there is a mismatch, there is a danger for argument where there's a breakdown and an argument about division on the basis that I say, well, yeah, all right, there's a uh, transfer. Yes, there's land registry form jail. Yes, there's a deed of trust. But the reality is I was contributing a lot more than my partner and therefore I'm entitled to more back. In those circumstances, I repeat the point that the court's starting point is always the documentation. And there has to be exceptional circumstances for the court to go behind it. And where parties have received legal advice as to what's being done, and that legal advice is, hey, you shouldn't be doing this because it's not mirroring what your actual contributions are, there's a danger that a court says, well, these aren't exceptional circumstances. You were told about what you were doing when this deed of trust, this transfer, this land registry form JO was created, and you decided to override or ignore it and proceed anyway. So the court may well say in those circumstances, we're not prepared to look behind the documentation. Clients need to understand that. What's the position if the beneficial interest isn't specified? Well, then there is a common law assumption that uh, the beneficial interest will follow the contributions. But again, we don't want to be in that, in that sort of exercise or scenario because it, then it's necessary in the event of litigation or dispute to do quite a, a serious sort of accounting exercise to see what's, uh, who's got what relating to the beneficial interest. In that situation, the co-ownership questionnaire is particularly useful because there you've got in the party's own words what the contributions are with both of them signing it. So difficult for one party to argue that uh, what's contained in there is not correct. Is a deed of trust required? Well, as I mentioned, if we're all the deed of trust is doing is acknowledging contribution, you could argue that the transfer in box 10 or land reform form JO would suffice. But in most circumstances, the deed of trust is in fact going to be doing more than that. And therefore, a deed of trust might be appropriate. I repeat the point you can charge for the work that you do with regard to a deed of trust. Uh, another point that I haven't mentioned yet, it is absolutely imperative that clients are told of the need to keep deeds of trust under review. Where one party is spending money on renovation, extension or alterations, where mortgages are being redeemed or reduced due to bonuses or inheritances, anything of that nature will scupper what the deed of trust says relating to the beneficial interest, or certainly has the potential to do so. And therefore, the deed of trust requires variation. I think that when we are advising clients and explaining to clients their choice, we give them that warning. And I would also advocate you give the client the warning again when you're closing your file. So you're telling the client, look, Mr. Mr. Client, my role in this transaction is at an end. 
because the transaction is at an end, but we've prepared a deed of trust for you that stipulates whatever it stipulates with regard to the beneficial interest. If there are any changes with regards to contributions, payments, etc., let us know because that deed of trust should be revised. Just going to move on if I can. And I can't understand. There we go. That's right. Now then, can we convert a tenancy in common to a joint tenancy? Answer, yes, we can. But we need the consent of all parties. And it's not a simple exercise. RX3 needed to remove the form A restriction. Copies or certified copies of new trust deed were appropriate. Certified copy of transfer and a statement showing out showing that no one other than the joint owners have shares in the property. None of the joint owners have any form of uh, issues related to bankruptcy or charging orders for creditors relevant to their share of the property. And in those circumstances, the intention of all the parties is that the property is owned together as beneficial joint tenants and joint tenants in law too. So it's important that where a, such a conversion is taking place, the clients understand the mechanics of conversion and that consent from everyone is necessary for the exercise to be successfully concluded. The next thing I want to talk about is something that I've been doing a bit of work on recently. Remember that a TR1 doesn't have to be signed by buyers unless there are covenants that the buyer is entering into with the seller. So what's the position if we've completed box 10, but our, trans our buyer clients don't sign the transfer? Is that potentially going to be a problem? Well, it could well be a problem where we have situations where the other documentation is inconclusive. So you've got Taylor against Taylor, where exactly that situation arose. The parties were in dispute. It was a family dispute as to how the beneficial interest was to be held. And the TR1 was silent. And what the court did here was, in essence, said that the sellers were capable in essence of being trustees in relation to the trusts on which the property was held by the buyers. And in sole funding, the court said that ticking the box with the appropriate box relating to co-ownership wasn't enough to create an express declaration of trust. The document needed to be signed by the buyers. So I think what we have to do with regard to co-ownership is make sure that our clients sign the transfer and I think before they're signing it, we should warn them to check what box 10 has to say. And we need to check it as well to ensure that when we've drafted it, we've correctly drafted it so that box 10 replicates what our instructions were. Very important point. The next thing that I want to do, and this is something that, again, I'm doing quite a bit of work on at the moment, uh, this case of Hudson against Hathaway, quite an interesting case which I think we can learn a lot from in connection with beneficial interest and detriment, et cetera. A different story for a different day. But the point that I want to extract here, and something I want you to think about here, is that what happened in this case is the court ultimately determined that an exchange of emails between two parties that formerly owned a property were sufficient to release a beneficial interest in the property from one party to another and this gets me thinking first of all there's the general principle that is interesting which has been uh, in existence for a while with regard to commercial transactions that a email with a sort of a, a footer with a, a name on is sufficient to be a document with a signature that can be binding on parties for the purposes of section 53 1a of the law of property act 1925 but what we had here were two clients who were trying to sort something out with regard to a property called picnic house between them uh, and the dispute wasn't a picnic to be to be fair there'd been an issue with regard to some contamination that had sort of affected value of the property and so you had mr hudson wanting to extricate himself from contamination issues and the parties wanting to divide up assets between them on an equitable basis so you had an exchange of emails in that regard sorry i'll just go back to this slide apologies 
<clears throat> and because Mr. Hudson's emails had his name on at the bottom, there was a signature and there was evidence compliant with section 53 1a that released the beneficial interest in picnic house to miss hathaway so when the parties litigated and this wasn't debated at first instance it was debated on appeal the court said that they were entitled to look at the emails emails and that the conclusion in connection with that exploration was that the exchanges were enough to transfer beneficial interest. So why do I mention it here? Well, I think that we need to be telling clients about this. Certainly where we're dealing with co-ownership and where there, it, there is uh, the email with regard to explaining to clients what happens in connection with relationship breakdown, I think clients need a warning that if the relationship does break down, there is a danger in exchanging emails between one another that one or other commits to something that they wouldn't necessarily have committed to and wouldn't have been advised to commit to. Now, this case gets me thinking, should we be telling every client about the danger? I don't think it's necessary to do that, but I do think it's necessary where we have clients where there isn't necessarily a sort of matrimonial resolution to disputes. Um, so where we've got commercial clients buying properties, where we've got unmarried clients buying properties, I think it's important that we warn them that if the relationship breaks down and if there's discussion or negotiation with regard to beneficial interest, then either the clients uh, do so via your firm or your good offices, or alternatively, they pepper or litter their emails with contract denied or subject to formal contract or something so that they are not committing to anything during negotiation. Really interesting case. Um, there's a webinar coming up on this. I think I'm doing with a guy called James Balance at some time in the future that might be of interest to people. But to be honest with you, I think the issues with regard to detrimental reliance, etc., are more relevant to family lawyers than conveyances. We'll have a look at some conclusions then for a moment or two, and then we'll deal with some questions. Firstly, I think co-ownership co questionnaires are essential. And I think you should have a look at your co-ownership questionnaire to make sure you're asking the right questions. I think that it is imperative that you early doors in any conveyancing transaction explain choice and then i think what we've got to do is listen to clients as to where they're going and what they're thinking about relating to choice so the items for discussion the thinking of the client is extracted from the client we listen and then we say to the client yep perfectly logical, perfectly sensible, that's what I would have advised you to do, or alternatively, that's not sensible, this is why, and my recommendation is something different. In connection with the latter course, it is essential that we are really protective of ourselves. What is the position when we're listening to clients and one says, I want to be a joint tenant, and the other one says, tenancy in common? Well, in that situation, we've got to stop and we've got to say to our clients, you need independent legal advice and come back to me to enable me to proceed when you're both singing from the same hymn sheet. Someone asked him a question on Tuesday when I was doing some face-to-face -face training. What happens where one client is being particularly generous and therefore you've got to warn them about what you're doing? How does that work given the fact that you're acting for another client, is it necessary to tell that client to go and get independent advice relating to what they're proposing to do? I don't know any firms that in that situation would say to one of the clients, go and get advice because you're giving away a 50% share of the property or a 20% share of the property. I think what you should do is make sure that where you're giving that client advice, hey, Mr. Client, don't do this, I think it's only right that you share with the other side. 
Now, there I'm worried about confidentiality issues. So I think when you're onboarding a co-ownership client, you should explain to the client that whilst you're acting, any communication that you send to one is sent to the other. Because I think it would be very unfair for you telling client number one, hey, don't do this, and saying nothing to the other client. But I'm, I may be wrong and I'm welcome to views. This point that I mentioned in my introduction about assuming nothing is so important. It is essential that we don't go into a conveyancing transaction with preconceived ideas. Don't think that existing clients get the picture with regard to co-ownership, so don't need advice and assistance. Again, it might be that they bought two or three properties previously, but no one has carefully considered or advise clients of the consequence of choice. I think we should warn clients, given the case that I've just drawn to your attention, uh, a warning about email communication where relationship is broken down. Perhaps there's a uh, mileage in telling them anyway, you know, be careful about any form of friendly discussion about what's happening to the uh, beneficial interest. So it's not a question necessarily of being at, at war, but it might just be a situation where friendly negotiation is taking place and that friendly negotiation can generate or create commitment. With tenancies in common, I think it's important that we advise that deeds of trust must be used. You can use land registry form JO. I mentioned it in the notes, but to be honest, it doesn't do anything much further than box 10 in the transfer. I think it's important that we explain what we've done with regard to the deed, particularly with regard to relationship and trust management, and explain how it deals with issues going forward. And I do think it's important to tell clients that the general presumption with regard to a trust is that when the purpose behind the trust comes to an end, that the property is sold. With joint tenancies, remember what I said about explaining unilateral severance. Explain to the clients with regard to severance that we create a tenancy in common in equal shares and the significance and consequence of that, highlighting what we've said already about tenancies in common. Um, we should explain to clients what can be done if things can go wrong. So we should be contacting our family or private uh, client department to seek advice. Um, and we should retain records of instruction, advice, and clients' understanding of advice. Where relationship goes wrong as between the parties, can we act for one and not the other? I would maintain in that situation it might be prudent not to do so, on the basis that we may have advice and in, we may have information rather that we've gathered during the conveyancing process that could be useful for one as opposed to the other. But again, uh, it's a matter for you. And now I'm going to just go back a moment or two and just ask two, one or two questions if I can. Um, so it's time for questions, if we can do with, deal with those, Stephen. Does anyone have any questions? Are there any questions in the chat box? Yeah, thanks very much, Ian. Um, there are a few questions. I, I'd say yeah. to everyone, as a reminder, if you want to submit a question, please do so in the uh, question section of the control panel. Um, yes, we have had a few, so I'll just try and uh, go through oh, a few of these. Yeah. Um, it, very early on, uh, Joanne asked, and there was a couple of questions on this, about mm. the questionnaire, and I think you've clarified that. So there is the, the proposed questionnaire in Appendix A of the notes, is that correct? Yeah, there is. Yeah. Um, and again, th there's a barrister called Alan Tunkel, great guy from Three Stone Buildings, in uh, now called 3SB, who devised it years ago. And Alan was a great guy, and he said, look, tell the profession about it. Quite, I'm quite happy for them to use it. Now, I think I've tweaked it a bit, but you get, you know, it, I'm not saying it's the definitive guide, but I am saying it highlights some issues that frequently aren't highlighted. So you're more than welcome to use it. You can check it against what you've got. But I think it's so important to have information from the client on your file so that if your insurer or a county court or a high court judge or the legal ombudsman says, you know, how did you base 
your advice, you can say, well, the clients told me this is what they wanted to do, and I looked at the co-ownership questionnaire that the clients had completed and what their circumstances were, as indicated by that questionnaire, meant that what they were proposing was, was consistent with that data inf and information, and also it appeared logical and sensible, and therefore my advice was that for them to do what they wished. Or alternatively, Stephen, you might have a situation where, going back to my uh, example, you might have the client saying, we want the world as joint tenants in law and in equity, but the co-ownership questionnaire shows that client A has been married three times before, has eight children that are in essence dependent on them and has utilized all the proceeds of sale from that property to facilitate the purchase of this. And therefore you're saying to the client, well, look, that wouldn't be appropriate given what you've told me in the questionnaire. So what you're doing is you're arming yourself with evidence to uh, support or challenge what the clients want. And you're also, defending yourself and your firm in case there are problems going forward. Thanks for that question, Stephen. Yeah, thanks Ian and thanks Joanne for that. Um, yeah. Question from Mark Cairns. Mark asks, how yeah, far yeah. does one go in explaining that severance can occur by conduct and that it is essential yeah. that legal advice can taken immediately in the event of relationship difficulties? Yes, yeah. yeah. Great question, Mark, and hi. Um, what I would do in a situation like that, Stephen, is I would simply say to the client it is possible that conduct may amount to severance and to give examples so you know negotiating a sale of your half share mortgaging or charging your half share would be sufficient to constitute conduct but i don't think the client needs a sort of landlord essay on the issue i think as mark says you know if you are contemplating severing the tenancy, or if notice is served on you, then contact my private client or family team. Great question. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Hmm. Um, another question from Joe. Joe asks, uh, says, hi, Ian. What would your view be on the following? And I'll, I'll try and read this out. So it's quite a uh, long question. Uh, thank you. Two clients, A and B, whereby hmm. the property is registered in the sole name of A, but B yeah. can to the full purchase price and paid all mortgage payments etc however yeah. there is no form a restriction and nothing to suggest property is held on trust brackets i.e yeah. no trust deed or express trust document yeah. a and b both agree property is held on trust for b and legal estate is to be transferred to b and effectively end the trust how can this be documented in the tr1 <laughs> Well, it can't be documented in the TR1. Um, what I would do, if I was acting for the party that, whose name is not on the title, then I would either protect with a restriction, with agreement, or alternatively put an agreed notice on the title. Um, as far as a buyer is concerned, a buyer might have notice of that party's interest in the property, if they inspect us and that party was in occupation. Remember when someone inspects a property and there's someone in occupation that appears to be an adult and who's not party to a contract, the buyer should make inquiry of them. So in those circumstances, I would maintain that even if there was no protection on the title itself in connection with the non-owner, uh, if that party was living in the property, then I would maintain that they would have an overriding interest that would be binding on a buyer. But in short, the person who is uh, where it, it, the beneficiary of that trust, which should really be advised to impose a restriction on the title. Uh, you could potentially place a notice on the title on the basis that what you're doing is protecting a pending action. Great question though, interesting, but I think that's my sort of off the cuff answer. If the delegate, I forgot the name delegate, Stephen wants to, ping an email across, I'll have a, a further think about it, but that's my initial view. Good question. Any other so, questions? And to, to Joe and, and to anyone else um, still on the webinar, if, if you do have any further questions after the webinar, if you respond to the GoTo webinar email that, that follows up from this, that does mm -hmm. come to me and I can, I can send anything on to Ian and I can 
yeah. your videos are on the following slide i'll like to potentially uh, i don't know where they are i think we've got some pretty we've got some slides from a previous webinar which i don't understand so uh i'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, i'll try and look through and see if i can dig them out for you but uh bear with me um i'll ping right the way to the end and see what we've got whilst you're doing that again, there's a few questions i'm yeah. going to right hopefully i guess to, to put a few together because i think they're asking similar things not quite the same yeah um Gail asked what advice to give uh, if tenants in common, if they then marry. Um, there's another question from Mark saying, mm -hmm. would you advocate sending out a questionnaire where the buyers are married? Yeah, uh, yeah I think, I think well, that, that, some great questions there, right? Just because the parties are married doesn't necessarily warrant the creation of a joint tenancy. Remember, where someone is married or in a civil partnership, then to be honest, what the title says to an extent is in irrelevance on the basis that the court in connection with a civil partnership dispute or a marital dispute can apportion and divide up family assets however they wish. So I think that uh, the important point there is that you wouldn't necessarily say, look, we've got to convert this joint this tenancy in common into a joint tenancy. There might be tax benefits. But from a, a legal perspective, I don't think it's necessary to, to uh, or I don't think it's a pressing issue for a tenancy in common to be divided into a, or to be created into a joint tenancy. I think the other thing, and again, this is pro private client and family work rather than our work, but where you have that situation, where clients have wills, it's important that on marriage they um, make a new will. But I, but I think to answer your question, Stephen, or to answer the number of questions, I don't think that it's necessary for a client um, who is unmarried on marriage to convert a joint tenancy, to convert a tenancy in common into a joint tenancy. I don't think that's necessary. Perfect, thank you. And on a similar line, Ian, one other question was, should both clients sign the same single questionnaire or each sign his or her yeah, own separate? Yeah. Yeah, well, well, as I mentioned in my presentation, Stephen, uh, part of me says, you know, if you send two questionnaires to two individual clients, they're going to sit around the dining room table or the kitchen table and fill them in together. So if, if we're worried about undue influence or indeed anything else, I don't think what we're doing is going to generate any protection. So I, my view is they can fill it in on their own, they can fill it in collectively, as long as they both sign it, then I think you're protected. I think where there was the slightest hint of undue influence or exertion or pressure from one to the other, then that might be different. So if I become aware of that, it's like what we were saying earlier about knowing your client. If I know there's sort of an abusive relationship or there's a peculiar relationship, then I might say, well, look, I'm going to email it to you separately. I want you to complete it separately and ping it across to me. I think that's how I'd operate it. Perfect, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I apologise, there, there are still a number of questions coming through. I think we'll put a cut off there, Ian, but oh, um, we, will, we will get back to everyone mm -hmm. with, with yeah. other questions. Uh, we, yeah. have, we have about 13 or 14 in the, uh, in the chat oh, yeah. box, so we can get for a while. <laughs> Stephen, last, um, night, last night, you know the time I got finished, I had questions about the Building Safety Act. I started dealing with them at six o'clock and I finished them at midnight. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I have a night off, but uh, tomorrow over the weekend, I'm delighted to deal with any co-ownership questions that you send across to me. That's great. That just leaves me then. Thank you to Ian for today, and thank you to everyone for joining today's webinar. Just quickly, once you leave today's webinar, there is a short survey, and it would be incredible, incredibly helpful if people could take just one minute to fill it out, as it does help both ourselves and Ian for both yeah. future presentations and our own products and services. Um, one of the questions, we have updated our integration technology and basically what this is, this allows our online ordering platform to sit directly on a case management system or another third party system. So that's mm -hmm. why it's asking you about case management, if you could answer that. We're also releasing a feature next month which will allow you to make certain amendments to our standard assumptions when you're ordering an online policy without having to speak to an underwriter, which is a really nice feature. As, as for the webinar, as I said earlier, you will receive an automated message from GoToWebinar following uh, the, the end of the session. If you respond to this email, the replies, as I say, will come back to me and I can send any questions or feedback on to Ian. 
you'll also receive a separate email from my colleague Robert Kelly which will contain the slides and the notes of today's session as well as a link to the recording. I just even say on behalf of Stuart Title and Ian Quayle thank you to everyone for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everyone, bye. -bye.